Hey folks, Joe here. Real quick note before we get to today's further adventure segment. Uh, as many of you listeners know, Keith and I often record our segments, uh, sometimes well ahead of time, so that we can edit them down, get them over to Ed, so that he's got plenty of time to drop them into the show. Uh, the segment you're about to hear, Keith and I actually recorded this back toward the end of February. So uh, suffice, it, suffice it to say, a little bit different world back then. It was before a lot of things went down globally regarding the pandemic. Uh, back when things were a little more lighthearted, events were still happening, film productions were still on track, Indiana Jones 5 News was coming in like crazy, it was right around the time I think, uh, it was uh, right after uh, right after that Spielberg had dropped out, news came into that, so didn't get a chance to talk about any of that. And so we just wanted to give everyone listening some context as to when we actually recorded this segment. It is an understatement to say that a lot has changed in just a few weeks. Um, so we're going to chat a little bit about that on our next segment. We're going to be trying to record some of these things uh, fast and furious. We're going to record a few of them. Uh, we've got our Temple of Yearning in, uh, review coming up. We also have an interview with artist Ethan Beavers. That's pretty cool. And we also have our Indiana Jones Adventures Volume 2 review. That's all coming up, so we're going to get those today. Today uh, is going to be our Tomb of the Gods review. We were able to drop in Chris A's review. We have your emailed reviews uh, that you've sent to us, so we're going to read those on the next segment. So go the, go ahead and get those into us. Uh, the further adventures at gmail.com. You can get those to us, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get those in as well. If not, then we'll get them on a future segment. Today, our job is to just hopefully bring you a little entertainment, take your mind off things for a while uh, while you're at home. So sit back, relax, get your indie funny books out and read along with us. And above all, stay safe, follow all the precautions. We're all in this together uh, and we'll get through this. So, And now enjoy our review of Dark Horse Comics, Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods. Stanley presents, oh, hey, that's me, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Excelsior! Welcome. It's time for the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Sharing your adventures is an interesting experience. Pack your bag, grab your passport, and prepare to go globetrotting with Dark Horse Comics' classic four-color adventures of Indiana Jones. Jones? Jones! Dr. Jones, the eminent archaeologist. Hard to believe this. Oh, man. Now, what shall we talk about? Welcome, IndieCast listeners and further fans to the further adventures of Indiana Jones. I am Joe Stuber. He is Keith Voss. Keith, my buddy, how are you doing over there in Austria? Doing good, my friend. We're well on our way with this further adventure of Indy. And that's going to be... Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods. And I hope you guys caught our in-depth interview with the writer of this Dark Horse tale, Rob Williams, who was on the last episode of the IndieCast with us. We had a really fun time hanging out with him in the Raven's Nest, talking indie and talking all kinds of fun stuff, talking Judge Dredd, talking oh, all wow. kinds of cool stuff. So Yeah, isn't if, that fun? Just, guys, yeah, check it out. Yeah, if you guys didn't hear that, definitely check it out. Um, pour yourself a whiskey and yeah. uh, <laughs> whiskey. sit back and enjoy the show. Always a fun time we get to hang out in the Raven's Nest and bring people Absolutely. in and talk Indiana Jones. And everybody's like always Indiana Jones fans. That's a really cool part about this is you talk to these, the, and we talk to so many creators over the years, but yes. it seems like most, if not all of them, are Indiana Jones fans on some level. So I think that comes through in all these projects. Um, yeah, and look, we, we said... Go back years, right? Uh, longtime listeners of the IndieCast know that we started our look at Tomb of the Gods way back in May 4th, 2015. That was on IndieCast episode 210. That's when we invited artist Steve Scott into the Raven's Nest. So, Keith, as you said, we are well on our way with this adventure. We've been talking about Tomb of the Gods for a while, but now it's our turn to talk about Tomb of the Gods, what we think about it. So we're going to tell all the listeners out there what we think of this miniseries from Dark Horse Comics. <laughs> all right, as always, we are going to spoil the miniseries for you if you haven't uh, read it already. But I'm uh, Keith, I'm guessing most of the people out there probably read it, right? <laughs> I hope so. I hope <laughs> By so. By now. It's uh, a good it, one. It is a good one. And if they have not read it, it's pretty easy to find. Um, what, what, what We got the, the four individual issues, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, we got a trade paperback. The yep, Dark Horse, which is what I, uh, which is what I'm going to be using for our review tonight. Okay, I've got the four issues. You've got the trade paperback. We've got most of the bases covered. There is what I thought was pretty cool. Uh, Publisher Spotlight released the issues in four individual, 24-page hardcovers 
for libraries in August 2009. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. So I'm sure Les David has he's probably got those <laughs> up in the museum, yeah. right? Exactly. Uh, they belong in a museum. They belong in a library. They belong, you know, he got lost in his own library. Maybe he was reading Indiana Jones uh, books. All right, so that's how you can get your hands on the adventure. It is a good one. Keith, how's about you give us the creator rundown, which, here you go, it's going to switch up a little bit with that fourth and final issue. Yeah, it certainly does. Here we go, guys. Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods. Writer Rob Williams, pencil Steve Scott, inks Nathan Massengill, colors Michael Atier, letters Michael Heisler, covers Tony Harris, and as you mentioned, a change in the creative team with issue number four. The artwork was handled by Bart Sears, and the finished inking on pages 15 to 22 were done by Randy Elliott, but Steve Scott, Nathan Massengill, and Michael Attier were we're the team for the cover of issue four. So, I mean, definitely a lot of changes going on there. Um, and I do think it shows in the book. Um, oh, yeah. Always, maybe yeah. slightly to its detriment. I don't know. We can talk about that. We'll get oh, into sure. It. That's Hey, that's uh, what we're here for, right? <laughs> that's yeah, why we're not yeah, going yeah, back yeah. today. Um, yeah, as we mentioned. Um, okay, so the book is running a little bit, of, a little bit behind. Just some behind the scenes. Uh, the four issues were supposed to be released July 2008 to December 2008. The final issue wasn't released until March 2009 using a different team, as you mentioned. If you go back, if you haven't heard it yet, uh, after this review, you can go back and check out the Steve Scott interview. He did mention it. He was pretty open about it. Uh, oh, the yeah. book was already on a tight schedule. We talked about that with Rob Williams as well. So this was a crazy tight schedule. Uh, they're coming in. This is the year of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So Indie Fever was at a pitch. They were trying to get this stuff out. Um, but uh, Steve Scott also mentioned he was going through a divorce at the time. So you know what, Keith? Life happens. Things happen. Yes, it does. Yes, yeah, it I mean, does. we all we all go through things like that. And so something had to give in the book, and he had mentioned about, um, you know, he could have flip-flopped three and four or something, but you know what? It was He just wanted the, the first three, and then uh, another creative team came in for the art. But he did do the, the artwork on the cover of four, and that's the one that's used on your trade paperback, correct? That's right. That's right, which okay. I think, um, you know... I think that it's looks fitting. Like, yeah, it is fitting. And you know what that looks like? That picture of Indy on the cover. You know oh, what that I'm, looks like to me? I think it looks like our favorite scene. <laughs> it's our Temple favorite Doom, scene yeah. from Temple of Doom. Yeah. That's right. All of us. Yeah. That, I mean, when, when that light hits him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the, 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 the kids pushing the, the card and the light finally lands on, on, on Indy, that's what they're what, – what, that's what that's from. I mean, it's clear to me. It's an action-packed cover. I, I do love all the covers. Um, again, spoiler alert. I think you and I have talked about this a lot. We love this series. There's so much good yeah. in it um, yeah. as we go. And one of the things that, that you and I talked about a little bit before we started recording was you talk about the covers. So let's get into the covers, and then let's also get into the covers. Let's get on the yes. inside of the covers. That's Which, one of your favorite parts of the book, right? It is. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the trade paperback right now, uh, yeah. which does not have this. No. And each inside front cover of the individual issues had Indiana Jones's passport to include like the publication information and so on, as well as displaying a chronology of the places that he visited in this entire adventure. So uh, a list of the dated stamps and the issue of the first appearances, for example... Uh, May 23rd, 1936, New York, that was issue number one. June 6th, 1936, Tibet, that was also issue one. June uh, 12th, 1936, Shanghai, issue number two, and so on. North Pacific, Siberia. I love that they do that. If, for me, it's like it's right along the same – uh, no pun intended, along the same line as the line. As yeah, the well, you've got the map like, in the back too because you can almost right. see that red line. I mean, it's right, not there, but right. you can almost picture like a red line going over that. And like Indy getting ready, like he's throwing his, his bullwhip, like he's got a map out. He's throwing the bullwhip down. He's got his passport out. Yeah. It's just like yeah, you I, feel like like Indy's going on an adventure and we're going along with him. I thought that was a very cool thing. So, and again, really touch. good reason to get the touch. individual issues, right? Yeah, for sure. For get sure. them all. It was a really nice touch. The only thing was the entry for the North Pacific is not in chronological order. It may be a typographical error in issues yeah. three and four, but, um, you know. Hey, a lot of cares. stuff going on between <laughs> three and four, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so uh, we can we can, we can can forgive them for that. That's to be we? forgiven, yeah. And we talked to Rob uh, about this as well, too, is that I don't – okay, so these dates – I mean, depending on how you look at or you know, it's very close to Raiders. Yes. So, like, really close to Raiders in 1936. But as Rob mentioned, 
the spirit, as you're reading this book, kind of take yourself out of that. It doesn't necessarily have to be locked into a specific month or year right there. But the spirit of the book is basically an Indiana Jones in between Temple of Doom Indy and Raiders Indy. That's sort of right. fortune and glory Indy, and it belongs in a museum Indy. He's mentioned that quite a few times. And mm-hmm. that's we, – we see that play out in this adventure so well. We, Again, yeah, character we, development, really good character development. Absolutely. And I'm glad they kind of touched on that a little bit because that was something that a lot of people always talked about, um, that, that he is such a different character between um, between Raiders and Temple. So I'm really glad that they touched on that. Yeah. And um, if you want to also, uh, for fans of Back Issue Magazine, you might want to check out uh, Back Issue Magazine, issue 55. Uh, goes into the, I mean, obviously back at the time, you were talking about a lot of Dark Horse and Indiana Jones comics. So there was a nice write-up on there. But it kind of gives us a, a, a nice intro uh, to this thing, uh, to this nice intro to this adventure. Um, why don't we get into it? We got uh, part one. Uh, why don't we get into part one a little bit? And let's talk about, well, first of all, let's talk about the cover. Um I mean, again, it's just a lot of a lot of action packed Indiana Jones going on in these, and that's what I love about these covers. And it doesn't I mean you've you've got sort of the MacGuffin playing into it. So I do like the fact that it is tied into this adventure in particular. I agree. And I love that the uh, they captured the essence of, of of not only the the adventure, but they captured the essence of Harrison Ford as the character. I mean, looks great. Looks yeah. great. And we start off in Siberia, 1931. So it's one of those things where it kind of goes back a little bit, uh, even like a pre-adventure. Um, kind of mm-hmm. reminded me a little bit of Last Crusade. Uh, there's some, a lot, of, a lot of Last Crusade inspired in here, but almost like that kind of jumping way back in time. It doesn't necessarily have to be like two minutes before the main adventure. Um, we sort right. of get the the background on this. But they don't give you too much information, which I like. It's just kind of like they discovered something, and uh, it reminded me slightly of the thing. Um, yeah, a lot. John Carpenter's the thing. Like yeah. it's in the snow. They discover something. Um, as we know in John Carpenter's the thing from uh, from 1982, um, they they eventually figure out that the Norwegians discovered something in the ice and what was it? So that that kind of reminded me a little bit of that. Yeah. So in 31, we've got archaeologist uh, Heinrich Melberg, Francis Beresford Hope, and Marwell O'Brien. They discover the key to the tomb of the gods. Uh, and it's divided up between them. So that's kind of like sets the stage for our adventure. So there's these three pieces that have to be collected. Obviously, Indian Jones is going to get involved, and we have that uh, going on five years later. And uh, again, it's just, I, you always, I don't know if you always have to have a snake joke. In an Indiana Jones adventure, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I don't think the one in Crystal Skull worked at all. Oh, no, no. I didn't like that one either. But, but and again, I don't think you have to have one in, but I think because there's the Indiana Jones film adventures are so few and far between, they feel like they've got to put one of those in. I hope there's not one in the new one, because we get it. He's afraid of snakes. Move on. Um, but yeah. this one I'm okay with. It's actually a pretty cool snake keg, right, to, to lead off the adventure. I mean, maybe they just wanted to knock it out of the way early on, so you don't have to wait Yeah, for it. it's like... Uh, but but it also, like, drives the... Uh, <laughs> it also drives the plot slightly forward. I mean, uh, yeah. Indy, uh, Indy dodges it, and uh, it bites one of the guy. You know, it, it, it strikes one of the... One of the guys, uh, and then we just go right into the action from there. And he just does what Indy does. He starts beating up some of the guys. He gets into he gets into a fight with a, a very Pat Roach like character who throws him through a wall of books. Oh, where yeah. he uh, where 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 we meet uh, Henrik Melberg. Yeah, and we and we have a really good setup of villains here too because it's so easy to just kind of go toward the Nazis, and mm. we do in a sense in this book. But it's this. How do you pronounce this? Is it this is the Anand Okay. Anand <laughs> Abbe. Yep. Okay. I'll let okay. you get that one. Oh, um, but it's like so. this cult. <laughs> but it's like this cult offshoot of the Nazis, right? Yes. So, so basically, it, the subgroup it, so or something. There, yeah, there, there's a subgroup that 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 basically um, uh, kind of the the paranormal group um that that would go out and hunt for exactly. paranormal uh relics and so on which is why they get into these keys these pieces right. of these keys and didn't that kind of remind you a little bit of the first captain america movie too when you have like red skull he's working with the nazis but he's really not he's got 
you know, uh, Hydra working. On, it's like the yeah, secret exactly. sub. It kind of exactly. reminds me a little bit of like that. There's, there's like this evil group within the evil group that's working. And it's just, it, there's so many layers here. And as you mentioned, yeah, Andy gets thrown into this other, um, in, into this other area. And, and there's some exposition that brings him up to speed as to where this is. But then this amazing sequence across uh, this skyscraper that's being built. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just this whole this whole thing plays out so amazing. And the artwork is just unbelievable. I love it. I love that two page spread of just like the the, the Manhattan uh, skyline in the background. And um, Andy mentions that he really hates secret passageways because yeah. they never lead anywhere good. <laughs> well, again, you're coming out of Temple of Doom, right? Right, right, so, right, right. That's so, fresh in his mean, mind. Again, if, if you are reading this comic, you definitely have to kind of go into it knowing that he just had that adventure yeah. not too long ago. Like that was the last real big one. And what did he take away from that? And who is he now? And that's why I, we mentioned earlier about um, the type of character that he is in Temple um, and the type of character that he is in Raiders and what he kind of learns in between. Or what he what he even learned at the end of Temple, and how he applies that to to this adventure as well. Yeah, and I really think um, both uh, writer and artist work together to capture Harrison Ford in here too, because the dialogue is you kind of get those Harrison Fordisms, those little asides as you go through the adventure, that like almost kind of under his breath kind of thing, yeah. uh, that amps up the humor a little bit. But then also the look too, I think, is is really really good, and then. This MacGuffin, as you mentioned, uh, as we're going through, it's referred to as, you know, what is what is this? It's a key to, you know, and it mentions the beginning and the end. So a lot of Indiana Jones, you know, something's going to go really wrong at the end of this adventure, too. Right. But and they're it, never they're never really that specific, um, even throughout the entire book, as to what it actually is. Yeah. Um, which I found to be quite interesting and 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 something else that we'll talk about more towards the end uh, a slight change in in the trade paperback as opposed to the single issues which would have given us more information uh as to actually what is what is legitimately in the tomb of the gods exactly get to that later though and then okay so all the characters being introduced in this first issue and we are also introduced to treasure hunter janice Leroy in a very interesting way too because there's this uh housekeeper or this maid uh, you know, at early on, and you're like, okay, what's that? And then Indy sees her again in the elevator, which you, you kind of, we always have that sort of elevator moment in movies where everybody's like standing there real quiet and it's real silent. And that plays out really well, I think, in this comic book until, yes. until she pulls a gun on him. And I don't know, but I love this character. I think she's amazing. I think she's a perfect spoil for Indy. I yeah. think, uh, you know, she, she gives him a run for his money. She's beautiful. She's, she's, she's extremely intelligent. Um, she's basically the female Indiana Jones. And don't you get like sort of a Mac vibe too that comes into this as you see the adventure play out? Like, to, because like with the double crossing and all that, and it's playing out and then like, yeah, there is an attraction. You know, not, not obviously he's Mac and Indy are attracted, but in the sense <laughs> of there's an attraction between him, like, would be with Marion, like we see with Willie. Well, we um, have no idea what Mac and Indy did in that trunk <laughs> for true. all that time. But that's anyway, true. that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. His hat was off. <laughs> um, but but we digress. Uh, but there is a, a very like Mac like quality about this, and I, and I don't think that was and, you know they didn't have the scripting or anything like that. But it just, I thought it was very cool to just sort of have you never truly know what side she's on. You she's know, on the side she, that's paying. Just like Mac. And isn't that like almost like a bringing some of Belloc in too, you know? Yeah, like Belloc absolutely. doesn't really care about the Nazis. And you know? I mean, to be honest, it was the same way with Indy. Indy was a mercenary too. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, a mercenary, a grave robber, uh, you know. And those are those are Harrison Ford's words. He's a the guy's a grave robber. I guess depending you know? right, I guess depending on your perspective, like any of these people could be heroes. If you're if you know, if the movie's about Belloc, then I guess Indiana Jones would be the villain, right? <laughs> right <laughs> you know, you're exactly. looking at if the if the movie was, you know, you know, Mac in the in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I guess Indy would be a bit of it, you know? It depends on what your perspective is. All so. about perspective and point of view, exactly. Yeah. And then we get into, you know, we have that adventure at the beginning, and then we end up back at the college. And something so rare in an Indiana Jones comic book tale, we get a spot on Marcus Brody. You're happy oh, with this goodness. one, right? Uh, yeah, this okay. is probably... Um, no, you know what? I'm going to say it. This is... 
hands down the best Marcus in a comic book. I won't argue with that at all. Yeah, um, I think it's that, that we've ever seen. Um, I mean, they absolutely. I would say they even they 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 nail Marcus better than they even nail Harrison Ford at times. I think so. And what I like about it is, it would be easy to sort of go into that real comedic Marcus, um, you know, for Rob Williams to sort of take mm-hmm. it in that direction because that was certainly the stage that was set in Last Crusade, and right. you sort of have that a little bit with. His outfit, like the, the his choice of outfits in different environments, but yeah, it's not yeah. full on comedy. He's not a buffoon not in this. On. No, he's very much that that Marcus. I think that we see right as Indy is ready to go to Nepal uh, in Raiders. You know, Again, and if I were a few years younger, good, I would have gone after it myself, kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's it's an interesting mix also of of the Marcus that we see in Raiders and the Marcus that we see in Last Crusade. Um, we see a mix, so it definitely it doesn't seem out of character when he makes a, a specific joke, or you know we've seen him make jokes in, in Last Crusade. Um, so it doesn't feel out of character for me. I do feel that the the, the characters of of Indy and and Marcus are written very well in this adventure, um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm quite happy with uh, with with exactly how they were written. I mean, it's really it's really uh, very well done. And each book ends like with a cliffhanger. We talked about this early on in the Further Adventures run where John Byrne wanted like, you know, four to six issue arcs. You know, he mm-hmm. wanted to leave the cliffhanger at the end of them. And, you know, at the time it was, nope, one issue, which is everything has to be resolved in an issue. Maybe two issues we'll give you, but that's yeah. about it. That's really tough to get a complete Indiana Jones adventure in just an issue mm-hmm. or two. So I like how this goes, but it's this is how it should be. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if you have a monthly series, give it four to six issues, uh, in which we see that now, obviously, that Byrne was so far ahead of his time because we see that now with trade paperback collections well, where well, they put them all I together. Think he, I think he wanted uh, it to feel more cinematic, and you yeah. can, it's, it's really hard to do with one issue. Um, with Like you said, with four to six issues, it feels more cinematic. You get to put in um, – you know, maybe with, 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 with one issue, you couldn't put – uh, a couple of panels of like the red line going to a different country or just like a plane or like, you know, a spread of like the plane in the air. Like you have to you have to condense it all. And, and that affects storytelling. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it definitely allows the story to breathe. We mentioned this before on previous shows, um, uh, stories that we thought could have even used even more issues or maybe uh, they could have cut back a little bit on, on, on some of that stuff. But uh, I do think that four issues for this story was was really a perfect amount. Um, it, it really um, gave us everything we needed. Yeah, and then so we they, in issue two they meet up uh, with uh, Beresford Hope's son Alex. There's the you know, whole thing about the explosion in the cave, and then mm-hmm. bandits and spies attack. And what I love about this too is that all these elements from previous Indiana Jones come, films come in, and we get an appearance of Jock. <laughs> Uh, start the yeah. engines, jock, and the whole running exactly. from the, you know, it's just like out of Raiders, but in a really cool way. It's, it feels fresh and new in this. And it's nice to, to know that Indy um, always sort of incorporates these other characters in on these adventures uh, that we like. We love that aspect from further adventures. Yes. Well, we know he can count on jock to get him out of, uh, <laughs> barely get him out of any jam. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, uh, the call letter, the call letters on the Obi-Wan, yeah. On the plane too, like so many of these things going on. Um, and, yeah, and great Beresford action. Hope's son uh, Alex is a great character. I really, really enjoyed that character. Yeah, um, just that he kind of is. Uh, he's looking like a um, uh, a monk, kind of, you know, and he's he's been protecting this cave. And yeah, um, it's a really, really interesting character. Really great looking things, and we've got the maps. One, uh, the you know, the maps with the red lines going. All the elements of Indiana Jones that we love are incorporated in this book. One really cool thing we we said this is 2008, so this is coming into Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. If you have those individual issues, I love just flipping through, and all of a sudden you come across these like advertisements for Indiana Jones action figures. Oh, if that had only taken off yes. like we wanted yes, it yes, to. Yes, yes. Uh, but you see like the lineup of Indiana Jones action figures, and it kind of makes me realize and remember like, oh, I've got those stored away somewhere. I need to go. I need to go drag those out at some point that was like a really cool time for indiana jones fandom there was so much stuff out it there. was 
it was a hopeful time because it was trading it, cards is an ad for trading every, cards. Yes, yes. I have the uh, entire series of like you know Raiders of Temple, and mm -hmm. I had all that stuff. You know what I mean? And it was a hopeful time. It's like, wow, are they going to continue making more movies? Are they going to make more comics? Are they going to make more figures? Are they going to? Oh, nope, that's it. It's just gone suddenly. Um, so let's hope with the with 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 the filming and release of Indy Five, um, we're going to get some more of that stuff. Let's see how long how long it would last this time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and again, we're all over the map here. We're all over the world. We're going to Shanghai. There's so many, I mean, so many very cool things that are going on here. Uh, we're getting near the Sea of Japan. And then, uh, man, just the way issue two ends. Uh, very, oh, we, yes. we talked about this with Rob a little bit because we asked him if he watched many Bond movies. And it's like, um, was it Friedrich? Uh, yeah. Is yeah. like, he's got this knife. It's not in his shoe, but it's like up his sleeve. Yeah, and, it's very Bond. It's very Bond. Von Hassel. Yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, exactly. And slashes Janice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's really cool. It, it is it is very Bond like. But you know what? Uh, isn't isn't Indiana Jones America's James Bond? I mean, I guess you could say that. You yeah, know, it's Ethan all based Hunt, on it. Ethan Hunt, you know, from you know, Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible movies. Like he's 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 kind of like the the uh, the American James Bond. But I always thought that that Indy was uh, was was the was the American version of, of of Bond? Well, the genesis we have is is you know, and he started off by you know, I get something better than James Bond, you know. George that's Lucas right. said, and of course, James Bond is his dad, so that's pretty cool too. And um, that's pretty cool. Too. Sharks in issue three. Jaws. Jaws. <laughs> yeah. Got a little uh, bit another another Spielberg uh, reference in there. Yeah, and then but we also talked about with Steve Scott. He gave credit to Rob Williams for bringing that hammerhead shark in. Uh, yes. we see, because as he mentioned, uh, you know, behind the scenes, up. yeah, they're bottom yep. feeders, so they yep. wouldn't be up at the top. But Rob wrote that in as a hammerhead from the the Mos Eisley Cantina, <laughs> right? Exactly. So there's even like a lot of Star Wars references, Easter eggs coming into some of these things too. And okay, so Indian sharks, a, a lot of our favorite environments. Keith talking India in the snow. We talked about that, or you know, we've always said that we wanted to see more of that. India in a boat with sharks coming at them. And then this really cool chemistry between Indy and Janice going on. There's just this, you know, he's trying to get her, he says to take your shirt off at one point, but that's not what he means. Right, <laughs> exactly. Right. His shirt's off. He says to take her shirt off. You know, he's trying and she, to like. And she, she, she gives him a huge punch too. At one yeah. Point. What does that remind you of? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you, you get a little bit of Marion in there, you know, yeah. um, and like like I said, there's that one uh, panel where the shark comes up, the great white comes up, and it's I mean it's the Jaws poster. I mean let's be honest, it is that's <laughs> right out of Jaws. Yeah, so basically he wanted to light a fire so that smoke would go up into the sky so that hopefully they could be seen. Uh, there's a romantic, seen. yeah, they do get seen. There's a romantic moment right before Jaws comes up. They do get seen. Um, and boy, just the artwork coming out of this though, the the shark getting harpooned right as it's about to attack them. They think that. You know, everything is over. Really, at that point, you know Indy's going to make it out, but it's such a cool vibe, too, of like, how in the world is he going to make it out? That's always the question is, how is Indiana Jones going to make it out of this thing? And then we get Marcus coming back, in, which and he's still not dressed kind of, properly. There's kind of a really nice moment here between Indy and Marcus, too. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, he hugs Marcus and says, like, thank you. Yeah. You know, for, for and, and, and you could definitely, you could hear the music that's playing over that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's when when you just get a visual and you're, you're reading a comic and, and and you basically just getting visual and you and, and and you know what Indy's voice sounds like. You can maybe make up a voice for for Janice, and of course you know Marcus's voice. But there's always the soundtrack that goes through my head in certain moments when I see certain um, uh, action sequences playing out. Like, I definitely hear the theme. You know, I definitely hear the the, the Raiders march. But like here, it was the moment where um, where where Sean Connery. Um, hugs. That's exactly Indy. what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah that's the right? scene I, I saw. Because then he even does the oof. You know, he does yep. that thing that Indy does yep. in that. Exactly. Again, all those little exactly. callbacks too. I got the same feeling. Um, well, even um, I think Steve Scott definitely said he had the the music playing in his head, and and Rob right. said he had the music playing. You you can almost hear um, and uh, the John Williams soundtrack playing all the way through this. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of great stuff in issue number three, um, and then. Okay, so again, Indy in the snow, very cool. You know, as we get in, there's the, you know, the dog sled chase, which is very cool. A lot of action-packed moments in here. One element that just kind of reminded me even of Crystal Skull when he jumps 
you know, from one vehicle to the next. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. I think that was written into the script in that adaptation, too, was like Indiana Jones takes two vehicles, his and yours, to you on the sled. Like he's jumping from sled to sled. It doesn't matter what vehicle he's on. He's going to be going. And then he slides down. Again, another great cliffhanger. A literal cliffhanger on this one. A literal cliffhanger. Yeah. Exactly. And then we and get into it- issue four, which, okay, so let's talk about that. Um, we yeah. love the art for one through three. Your thoughts on four. A great cover. Um, obviously, great we got cover. Again, uh, like, like like we mentioned earlier, this cover that actually made uh, the, the the cover for the trade paperback. Um, look, I I think that if you're reading the trade paperback and you're going from from uh, issue three right into issue four, it's a bit jarring. You're like, whoa, mm-hmm. there's there's definitely something going on here. But I remember getting the separate issues, and since there was such a a long period of time between three and four. I remember it not being as jarring, and it, and look, the 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 artwork is fine. Um, oh, it's, it's really good. I think it's good. It's very very good. I mean, you're 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 not getting as much of a Harrison Ford vibe from Indy as you did in the previous three issues because you definitely get more um, that it looks like Harrison Ford in the previous three issues. I think in this one, it's a little bit more of a generic. Um, a generic face doesn't actually look like Harrison to me, but I can get over that. Um, the detail in, in the artwork is incredible. There's a lot of detail here and you really, you, 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 you soak in each and every panel, uh, what's going on, especially like, uh, in the opening of the book after Indy slides down in the hole and he sees like the dogs and you can see just in the background, there's a couple of dead dogs and some of the, some of the guides that were with him are dead. And, and it's, 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 it's really a beautiful, looking issue yeah uh, i i agree i think you can get over the fact that it doesn't look like harrison ford yeah and again that's the thing we were they were so close in the first three issues and you got acclimated to that if it had been different yes. artists in each issue you could yes. but to have three of just so, such a solid looking uh harrison ford and dead on um you know char- characters of these but like you said the detail on this Incredible. It's just amazing that two page spread where they sort of get to this temple oh, um, yeah. and then we talk about now. the cthulhu um, you know, monsters and creatures, and there's just so much stuff going on. I don't, even to this day, I think I've read it a bunch of times. I still don't really know exactly what, I don't know 100% what happens. And when we talk to Rob Williams, I don't know that we got a definitive answer. I think all we know is that there, because like at one point, like Von Hassel's men get possessed and like yeah. they kill almost everyone. And it's like, well, where did that come from? And, yeah. and, and basically they're in this huge cavern and there's a door leading i mean a a gigantic door so you know you think that there's some kind of like huge tentacled creature that's gonna that's like living in 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 like you know in in the center of the earth or something or in another dimension and and that's a whole other thing too because they they do mention that there's like a star map uh above the door so maybe it was something that crashed to earth like uh, many many years ago, aliens. Uh, and it's just been, oh, is it yeah, aliens? Yeah, exactly, is everyone exactly. gonna get upset so, about aliens on this one? Exactly. So, they, but but they don't quite really go there. They just say it's like a map to the stars. Maybe it's something that crashed here many many years ago. We don't quite know. Um, we don't really know what's in there. What was it? Uh, H.P. Lovecraft. I think his his, yes. his thought process of this was H.P. Lovecraft meets Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, exactly. Kind of thing. So yeah, you do have that. So I think it's a pretty cool thing. Again, it's it's one of those things where. I think you and I kind of go back to, I really like when he throws down with a main villain, uh, mm-hmm. like Mola Ram, and <laughs> takes a guy out. And a lot of what we see in the Indiana Jones adventures are like these crazy end of the world things that happen and everyone kind of looks on as craziness goes on, like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. We see that in Last Crusade. We saw it in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, I don't know. I just kind of want, I, I just, I think that makes me just appreciate the ending of Temple of Doom so much more. When yes. he and when he and the bad guy just throw down, and he just takes him, he has to take him out, per, you know, personally. And Mola Ram is no pushover. He's oh, no. one of the well, he's one of the few villains that really got very physical. Yeah, with Indy, like you know, Indy was fighting him. You know what I mean? With Belloc, you know, he, nothing really happened with Belloc as far as uh, them getting into a. Um, you know, a physical fight or anything, or no. even you know, with 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 uh, Walter Donovan, none, none none of that happened. Uh, they 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 met their end in other ways, but like you know, Indy had a had a fight all around. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, it's I, almost like some of the other ones they set up Indy with the heavy, the Pat Roach kind of character, so you get that fight in the battle, but then. Yeah. 
you know, at the end, it's the more the end of the world kind of stuff. Although in Temple of Doom, you get both. You get the Pat Roach character and you get him thrown down with Mulder. But that right. also harkens back to the James Bond uh, movies too, because when you think of like Dr. No or, um, you know, some of the Blofeld things where it's just like a, a whole mountain collapsing or these things where, where James Bond and the, and the, the Bond girl has to ru- rush out. And right. things collapse in around the villain or something like that. I always kind of like when James Bond throws down with the villain and takes him out. Yeah. Where it's not like this end of the world kind of thing. I don't know. Um, it works. I, um, you know, I, I listeners, don't you weigh in. Talk. What do you guys think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but it, but it, it's very interesting because once, once, um, uh, once they hear that like horrifying sound, Indy just sort of knows like, oh boy, this is this this is this this has to be destroyed yeah like you know what i mean like he did we either we can't get out of here we have to like completely destroy this place yeah um well that's why and, he ends up there in crystal skull you know that's why i'm down here right. sister like you know that's, that that indiana jones came from somewhere it's almost like and it's almost like a throwaway line in that movie too like it's almost like yep i know i i've, I've seen this before, seen it before. Exactly. okay he's but doesn't it so then let's not do that you know right, <laughs> like right, if, if right, harrison right. ford as indiana jones has to say a line in something that says Yep, I got it. I've been down this road before, so I'm going to hang over. Then maybe don't do that. Yeah. As a writer, I would hit that part and go, oh, wait. If he's saying this, maybe maybe he has seen it before. Maybe the audience has seen it before, and we have. So just on that aspect, I love this series. I just maybe would have liked a different ending on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. But but it is kind of crazy cool with the the Lovecraft thing coming in. So – I'm kind of I'm a little torn on the ending, but I I don't think it takes away from the series as a whole. Uh, I agree. Uh, I think it ends a bit um, a bit abruptly, kind yeah. of. Um, but the the other interesting thing too is that you know with Crystal Skull, the ending of uh, uh, we talk about the similarities with Crystal Skull mm-hmm. is that you know knowledge was their uh, you know. They they wanted knowledge, right? They were archaeologists. The, okay. the, the interdimensional beings. The same thing at the end of of this book. Knowledge brings us closer to God. They were all, you know, they were after knowledge, and so so. I mean, a lot of similarities there. But I think they did something like that better in the Marvel movies in the Captain America. Go to go back to Captain America again. Mm-hmm. You know, with the Red Skull and the Tesseract and the plane going. I just think there was more to be had in that story. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I think there was just more done in the Captain America movies and the Marvel movies as a whole. I think you can have those sort of, uh, you know, Asgardian things coming in and the and the you know, uh, the you know the the Infinity Stones and all those. I think you can have all those MacGuffins, but you really have to have a knockdown battle. <laughs> I, there has to be stuff going on. I just don't necessarily want to see Indiana Jones standing there looking at something. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, but again, at the end of this book. We do get that sense of of what he has learned because yeah. um, the merc- the mercenary that he was in Temple of Doom and even at the end of this book when when she uh, when Janice calls him a treasure hunter and he says I'm not a treasure hunter sweetheart I'm a college professor so like you know he's starting to realize yeah maybe it is about kind of just discovery and and not about what these these uh, these items can do for me uh, personally but but what they mean for civilization for for our history you know so i thought that was a nice line to close out the book but i thought the book did uh end a bit abruptly yeah okay so what are your final thoughts then on the series indiana jones and the tomb of the gods uh really enjoyed it thought it was one of the better comic adventures um really really fun to see the evolution of the character of indiana jones between between temple and raiders i thought the artwork was fantastic i love seeing marcus i thought the MacGuffin was pretty interesting um and yeah we had a pretty cool villain and a pretty cool pretty cool overall adventure so yeah, yeah. i'd like to Thumbs see up. this one i'd like to see this one on the big screen i agree with all that as well and i think this is a pretty good way for the dark horse series to go out i know we've got the yes. uh, indiana jones adventures volume two but like for and we've got temple of Yaren coming out but as a proper dark horse comics miniseries full comic size miniseries which is what we've been accustomed to this was the last one for now. <laughs> yeah. Marvel, had, I don't think Marvel's going <laughs> to relegate the rights to it. Fingers uh, but, crossed. Yeah, who knows? But uh, for Dark Horse, this ended the, the proper uh, comic book miniseries. And I thought it was a strong one to go out on. So yeah, I thought, I, you know, the Dark Horse years are always a mixed bag, but I think this was a strong one to go out on. 
yeah, it definitely felt very cinematic. It definitely felt like it could have been it could have been a, a movie. Um, so yeah, hope hoping to see more of this type um, this type of series in the future. Again, with the release of of Indy Five coming up uh, in the next in the next year, uh, hopefully we'll get a couple more comic book series. Um, uh, and and if they're anything like Tomb of the Gods, I'll be a happy camper. Well, those are our thoughts on Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods. We also heard from Chris A. in the UK with his uh, perspective on this particular series. I always love when we hear from Chris. So, Chris, take it away. A British tar is a soaring soul as free as a mountain bird. No time to jump the shark, Dr. Jones. Hi, Joe and Keith. Chris A. from the UK here, with a jolly review of Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods from Dark Horse Comics. Let's put the jumping the shark references to one side right away. It's great to finally see an Indian Jaws mashup, though. Plus, they even threw in a hammerhead shark, too, which is one of my all-time favourite predators of the sea. This stunt was great right in the middle of the story, and I liked how it threw our hero in a hot water alongside the anti-heroine of the piece. The splash page with girders and skyscraper buildings was epic for me, and reminded me of the early Harold Lloyd and Lauren Hardy films from the very era this story was set in. This also for me was nice foreshadowing, being set in 1936, of Indy returning to New York and Donovan's apartment two years later in Las Crusade, where you can see the New York skyline, albeit with clever movie making miniatures, outside Walter's penthouse suite. Oh, does anyone here speak English? As ever, I was eager to find the brilliant British representation in this comic adventure. And this of course comes not only with Marcus Brody along for the ride, hurrah, but also with three of the mystical key keepers. Francis and Alex Beresford Hope and O'Brien too. It was a nice link to have the elder Beresford Hope be a contemporary of Marcus from his time at Oxford University, hinting at Brodie's own younger days of adventure. My absolute standard line from this tale is, you're not going to give me the speech are you Marcus? This for me is classic and hints back and forwards to Raiders and Last Crusade. Brodie is very often the voice of reason and balance to Indy's fortune seeking streak. And it's nice to know every time Indy sets out an adventure that Marcus and the museum funds, he has to listen to a little few words of wisdom from Marcus himself. The Bible speaks of the Ark levelling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. That's something to be taken lightly. No one knows its secrets. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. My one complaint from an Oxford Dictionary perspective, though, uh, rather than a Webster's Dictionary perspective, is that Marcus, as a son of these here sceptered isles, would never say pay raise. It's more like pay rise in the UK. He's actually more likely as a true Brit to say pay rise and look for that on his return to Marshall College for Indy. You say either, I say either, you say neither, and I say neither, either. As to the artwork, the likeness of Marcus was amazing throughout, but at times I just didn't recognise Indy at all, I'm afraid. So that's a small criticism. Jock's return, though, as always, was nice, with some great callbacks to Raiders. Jock's away. I did start to wonder, though, just when did he set up his hangar bar? Was it after 1936, or would he have had this going as a sideline back in the States um, while he was flying around the world as a pilot for hire? So we're standing in Jock Lindsay's hangar bar, and what's really great about this bar is the way that it fits into the Disney Springs story. I adored the fact that we got Indy in the snow, finally. And I know, Joe, we talked about exactly this on last Christmas's round table right here on the IndyCast. The icy set piece chase on the dog sleds and the ensuing fight with Indy jumping to the next sled was a true taste of his big screen adventures for me. I round off with a nod to the fedora to writer Rob Williams, who obviously hails from these great British Isles of ours. It is fantastic to have a UK creative in the Indy annals. 
and your interview with Rob last IndieCast episode was a treat too, John Keith. Being a huge fan of A Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I love how the story took us truly into the mystic and felt like a great adventure and part of the second great indie trilogy of stories uh, set truly within the 50s B-movie sci-fi, even though this was actually 1936. <laughs> yeah, magnificently we will fold into the mystic. I do wonder, can Marvel do any better than this when they relaunch Indy in comic book form post-2021? They'll have to work hard because Tomb of the Gods gets a huge thumbs up from me from this side of the pond. Indy, I love you! I'll catch you on your next review segment and that's a promise, Joe and Keith. This is Chris A from the UK signing off. I'll bugger off now as Alex Beresford Hope might say. And as always, if you guys want to drop us a line or send us your thoughts on Marvel or Dark Horse indie comics, especially Tomb of the Gods, be sure to get those to us at thefurtheradventures at gmail.com and be sure to follow us on Facebook at the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. We would love to hear from you. Okay, that's it for the day then. And with that, we wrap up our very in-depth look at Indiana Jones and the Tomb of the Gods. Writer, artist, review, what more can we say, Keith? Great miniseries. Terrific miniseries, and the next time we get together, our thoughts on a cool mini-adventure. That just so happens to also have a radio drama to go along with it. Yeah, a very cool radio drama to go along with yeah, it. There's was, a lot of radio dramas one. out there. Yeah, there are. There maybe gonna, more coming, too. No. That's that's going to be a good one. So prepare for that. It's, uh, it's going to be Temple of Yearning, so check out that radio drama while you're out there until the next time we get together. That's right. That'll be our look back at the 2009 Free Comic Book Day Indiana Jones and the Temple of Yearning next time on The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm.